Why, hello, everybody. <laughs> My name is Rigney, and I made a whole bunch of Ultramarine at Lake Tahoe Community College. And now I'm going to show you guys how I did it and what I got. Ultramarine blue is a synthetic pigment that has been produced industrially since the 19th century. It is chemically analogous to the naturally occurring mineral lazurite, which is the blue component of the metamorphic rock lapis lazuli. Natural lazurite possesses a more complex ionic composition than the synthetic material, including sulfate, hydroxide, chloride, and calcium ions, all of which are necessary for the geologic processes which result in the formation of the mineral, while the synthetic material only possesses the ions necessary to produce the blue color. Both materials contain a sodalite type cage formed from stoichiometric amounts of aluminum oxide and silicon dioxide, an alkali metal cation, sodium in this case, and a very interesting configuration of sulfur, the thiozonide ion, which is a negatively charged sulfur homologue of ozone. This sulfur ion is actually the blue chromophore of the ultramarine blue pigment. Ultramarine is produced through a general process of combining alumina, silica, sodium carbonate, sulfur, and carbon, then heating the mixture in a furnace under reducing conditions, followed by oxidizing conditions. I got the idea to do this project from a Science Madness post by a user called uh, Arkachiakaka, where they made ultramarine blue in their garage using a homemade furnace made from fire brick and a torch, and it was pretty inspiring. So uh, in that post was a link to a research paper by Hammerton and co-workers from 2013, which became the source material for me to work with and develop a synthesis using the resources and materials available to me. I was able to use EPK, which is a very common clay material. Um, EPK, according to the website Digital Fire, has nearly the identical composition as the kaolin that Hammerton's research group used. So I was pretty fortunate to just have that on hand, didn't have to order anything. After the first couple of trials, I did a deep dive into the literature available for ultramarine synthesis, and I found a paper by Wang and a big group of researchers in 2020, which has firing temperatures, reactant ratios, experimental procedures, all correlated with color photographs of the products from each run. It's a huge resource, very helpful for me. I didn't end up using any of the procedures from that paper, but I did get a good bit of insight into the nature of the products formed given different conditions, which helped me out a lot. That helped me formulate the idea of doing the reduction fire separately from the oxidation fire. Being a student at Lake Tahoe Community College with some connection to both the art and chemistry departments, I proposed the idea of doing this project on campus in the art department's metal foundry and kiln firing area, which was met with quite some enthusiasm by the art faculty and the chemistry faculty. So many thanks to Brian Urian of the art department and Sean Ryland of the chemistry department for helping me put this together and working with me to make it happen. The whole process took place in the 3D art studio and metal foundry. I would start by firing up the furnace so I would have time to weigh out and mix up the reagents while the furnace equilibrated to a stable temperature. Hammerton's procedure required the use of freshly calcined kaolin, so for some of the runs the art lab tech would fire a kiln with a couple containers of EPK to 600 degrees Celsius for 8 hours, which I would retrieve from the kiln at temperature and allow it to cool to room temp then take it to the storeroom where they keep the chemicals and equipment for mixing up clays and ceramic glazes. This is where I weighed out the reagents. Lack of focus has always been my weakness. So I'm starting out here weighing out 18 grams of sodium carbonate. In this run I'm using soda ash from the ceramics lab, but in other runs I used anhydrous sodium carbonate from the chemistry department. 18 grams of freshly calcined EPK, which is the source of silica and alumina.
10.8 grams of sulfur, which I am using unpurified from a garden supply center, and 2.3 grams of carbon, which is in the form of activated carbon provided by the chemistry department. I combined these and pulverized them for around 10 minutes per batch to get them fully mixed together. Poured the mixture into the crucible, which was very difficult to clean between runs. <laughs> Tamped it down, as in Woodbridge 1949. And then I'd toss on the lid so the carbon could reduce the sulfur to sulfide. While loading the crucibles into the furnace, it was necessary to wear a respirator with acid gas cartridges to protect against sulfur oxides generated during the first stage of this process. In some instances, the sulfur fumes were pretty substantial, but this is a very well ventilated workplace since it's also used for metal casting and firing kilns. It was necessary to close off the front of the furnace to maintain temperature and a reducing atmosphere. This first step is to heat the crucible up to 750 Celsius for four hours under a reducing atmosphere. During this phase, the sulfur is being reduced to sulfide and polysulfides, while the silica and alumina are bonding to form the sodalite cage structure around those sulfide ions. After four hours, I'd cut the heat and open up the furnace so that the crucible could cool down. At this point in Hammerton's procedure, I would just be cooling the furnace down to 500 Celsius, removing the crucible lids and pouring in an additional charge of sulfur. This causes the sulfur to immediately catch on fire and blast you with fumes, which sounds more fun than it really is. You're getting blasted in the face with sulfur dioxide and sulfur trioxide, which even with a respirator on, it's not my idea of a good time, really. So I decided to do this procedure stepwise, where I do the reduction fire one day and the oxidation fire another day. Excavating the product from this run, you can see there's a little bit of blue near the top where the mixture was in contact with some air that was in the crucible, and this was a fairly atypical result, since I was trying out doing a much larger batch than I had tried before. The other crucible was more typical of the runs prior to this, but I thought the camera was recording when it wasn't, so you don't get to see that process. Yeah, that yellow, very unusual result from my runs. I did try to oxidize the stuff later on, and that did not go well. Typically, I would get a whole lot of green stuff, which is the reduction product, and a tiny bit of blue stuff, which is the desired product in my case, from doing just the reduction fire. Here's the green stuff. Uh, it looks blue in this shot, but it's green. And there's the yellow and brown stuff. Then the next day I would fire up the furnace to 500 Celsius and weigh out however much green stuff I wanted to oxidize. And I'm adding 10% by weight of sulfur because that's approximately the size of the charge that would be added in Hammerton's procedure. Then I'd mix these reagents together, just grinding for a couple of minutes or so. In this case, the sulfur is just acting as an oxidizing agent. What we want to do is take those polysulfides that are inside the aluminosilicate cage and oxidize those to the trisulfur anion.
So then I would again load these crucibles into the furnace, this time with conditions optimized for maintaining a lower temperature and an oxidizing atmosphere, and leave the crucibles in there for two hours. In these conditions, the reaction mixture readily catches fire, which I thought was fun to watch as long as I had my respirator on. This is always the exciting part. Did it work? Is there going to be blue stuff in here? And it turns out there's a lot of blue stuff in here. So you can see from this result, the stepwise synthesis of ultramarine blue, it really does work. You don't have to get a long spoon and reach into the furnace and pour melting sulfur into the reaction mixture. It's a cool and interesting thing to do, but after a few trials it loses its novelty and apparently it's an unnecessary risk which can be avoided. I will point out that some of the later trials did result in slightly less vibrant blues, so perhaps I'm wrong, or perhaps I just didn't have sufficient temperature control. And there you have it, the product that you just saw being made. It looks kind of gray in this shot, but it's really more blue in person. Here's 10 of the samples I produced. I tried to get them all with the same lighting conditions, but it was outside indirect sunlight, which was changing due to wildfire smoke. But enough excuses. Look how inconsistent this is. So that's a testament to how finicky this synthesis really is, and how hard it is to control the conditions using the equipment I was using. Again, big thanks to LTCC art and chemistry departments. Links to research papers, the college, and my report on this project are in the description. Thanks for watching. <laughs>